In that case, he did not have a reaction, but he did when we gave him eggs. And mm-hmm. he did for and sure uh, when we gave him a PB&J. And so uh, we didn't end up in the actual emergency room, but we could have. That time. Right? For some people, I have a friend who gave his kid uh, some cashew uh, mm-hmm. ice cream and... Man, his face swole up mm-hmm. and it restricted his breathing and etc. Right, so these aren't things that you plan for. Ice cream is typically a pleasurable moment, but it right. turned into uh, a quick emergency. Right, so these are things that you really want to prepare for. Welcome to the Rich and Regular podcast presented by Success, where we explore life at the intersection of money. I'm Kirsten. And I'm Julian. And today's episode is a listener request about how to financially prepare for a child. Yes, a little broke bestie. A little a little, <laughs> little, little broke bestie. It's a huge question, though. We get that often. Actually, not that often these days. I Recently, think, we have. Yeah, and that's because we just shot, uh, or not shot, but recorded the episode on uh, the vasectomy, but we used to get that question a lot more, I feel like, when our son was just born. Our son's almost five now. Yeah. Um, But either way, as a result of that episode, a lot of people found it really helpful, uh, and then it sort of triggered a few other questions. We got some requests to do an episode on things we did or wished we'd done before we had our son. Yeah. So I had to go back a little bit. I was like, all right, yeah. it's been a couple of years. Because I'm thinking, you know, first grade, second grade at this point. But I was like, all right, let me let me go back in time and try to remember uh, what we did and what we wish we'd done and compile all of that into one nice list. Yeah, this is timely because we were also just talking to a friend a couple of weekends ago and she's always wanted to be a mother. And as she's getting older, she hasn't found a partner yet. But she wants to move forward with IVF or surrogacy to fulfill this lifelong dream of becoming Mm -hmm. a mom. And as she was sharing this news with me, my mind automatically went to giving her all this unsolicited advice, (laughs) which I did later apologize for. But clearly, I have something to say about this topic. So what better forum than, you know, a podcast where nobody can talk back? (laughs) So (laughs) I also, to your point, low key feel like this episode is going to be heavy on the hindsight is 2020, mostly because our son is a cusper. He's a pandemic cusper, (laughs) meaning... He spent half of his life pre-pandemic and has spent the second half of his life post-pandemic. So our advice is going to be caveated with all the ways the world has changed since 2017 or even 2016 when I was pregnant with him. But I do think a lot of it is pretty evergreen. Yeah, yeah. And and what's also... I will just say frustrating, at least for me, was when we recorded that last podcast, I was reflecting back on this article uh, that I read. I mean, and this was a long time ago. And yeah. Basically quoting how much it costs to have a child. And the figure uh, that I remembered, which stuck out of my head, was something around 250 about basically about a quarter of a million dollars. Mm-hmm. And I remember even reading that then, and just like I said in the other podcast episode, that that was, it seemed absurd. But then as a parent, I was like, well, no, that's actually pretty right. And if anything, yeah. that might be a little bit conservative. But literally, the week that we released that podcast, <laughs> new data, new study. Coming, it's like breaking news. <laughs> this is how much it costs to have a child. So basically, it's a lot more expensive than it was even back then. And so yeah. the number was a quarter of a million dollars. And now according to the Brookings Institute, Institution. They released some updated numbers. Obviously, this is largely impacted by inflation. And the new number is $310,000. Ooh, so a lot of how much it costs to raise a child from zero, or you could argue that the the, the the clock starts even before they're born, all the way up to 18. They're estimating in the U.S. it's around $310,000. Uh, and again, I, I still think that that's pretty conservative. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And again, you don't think about it that way because I think a lot of people are imagining that number relative to annual household income. But when you stretch that out over an 18 year stretch, you can kind of see like, well, yeah, that oh, actually absolutely. makes sense. And, and those years aren't consistent. Like it's easy to think that Correct. you're spending, you know, $18,000 a year on your child every single year. But you, a lot of that is front loaded, <laughs> depending on how, what kind of child care arrangement you have, or it's back loaded, depending on how you choose to educate your kid in either public or private school. Yep. But ironically, there was an article that was published in Bloomberg this week that actually does support the case for this episode because it suggested that foregoing marriage and parenthood has a bigger payoff for American women than it does for men. 
So in other words, that makes sense. if a woman doesn't have children, she ends up richer than a man who doesn't have children. Single women without children had an average of $65,000 in wealth in 2019 compared to $57,000 for child-free single men. But if you were a single mom, meaning you had a child, the figure was only $7,000. You only had $7,000 in wealth versus single dads who had a child who actually had $59,000 in wealth. Wow. So interestingly enough, single dads had more wealth than child-free men, which is, I don't know, presumably because they might be saving money on dating. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't know. But the fact is, if you're a woman, the financial impacts of having a child requires a different level of planning. Like there's the cost of the child and then there's the impact to your wages and earnings and and your wealth level. Yeah, I may need to explore that data with respect to dads separately. (laughs) But like just thinking about women, it, it, it totally makes sense. And again, it's unfortunate. I mean, obviously women are more likely to be the primary caretakers of a child here in the U.S. They are essentially forced to disrupt their careers, to have children. And on top of that, we still have an unequal world where women are paid less than men for the same work. And so it just goes to show that like politics and social norms and money all intersect, which is why we talk about it and talk about life at that intersection, because we actually find those things to be a little interesting uh, on our podcast. Yeah. So for today, I figured we could break it up into three different milestones, if you will. There's before the child arrives, so pre-child. There's birth itself, which is an event, honey, like a financial one and a mental and physical one. For everyone involved. (laughs) For everyone involved. And then there's after they're here and like the ongoing expenses. But before we dive in, I just want to make a disclaimer that we're going to try to make our suggestions as inclusive as possible. We completely understand there's more than one way to conceive a child or even become a parent, and that every Every single child is different with different needs, different considerations. So I can tell you off the bat that we'll probably leave some things out or simply just not cover it. It doesn't mean that it's not important or not real, right? So consider this episode a starting point and then add tax because kids are expensive. So (laughs) let's dive in. Let's start with before baby. So if you're trying to get pregnant, I highly suggest that you research Femtech, F-E-M tech. Femtech is a buzzword, my bad y'all, but it's a buzzword that was created a few years ago, but it basically means the use of technology to address women's health issues. Things like reproductive health, maternal health, even menstrual health, all kinds of women's health issues. And more specifically, it refers to the diagnostic tools, the products, services, wearables, software to do so. And I know this might be a controversial recommendation because given the political climate for reproductive rights, I know a lot of people have questions about data privacy and using these devices. That was where my mind went. Right. But in my personal life, I have used period apps and hormonal trackers for the last five years, and they have given me greater insight around my fertility windows so that we could be strategic about our family planning. It is an imperfect solution, but so is everything else, y'all. I was just about to say. <laughs> so is everything. If they don't buy it from your femtech, they're going to buy it from your search results and your say. YouTube channel search. And so, you know. They're going to get it one way or the They're going to get it one way or the other. But what this really helped me do was just not fixate so much on like, when is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? And it was really nice to not just be guessing every 28 days. You kind of had, you could enjoy the process a little more. So the, depending on what you use, there's either an upfront cost for the hardware, say if you're using like a thermometer to track your fertility or a possible ongoing cost for the app or the software. So you'll want to factor that into your budget. Just a couple, you know, $50 here, $100 here to make sure that you can afford the paid version, not the free version. I love it. Love it. Okay. So moving on, you've had the, or this is before the baby. Now, assuming you get pregnant, congratulations, clap it up. Uh, I was going to say po up, but that's inappropriate. <laughs> One of y'all can po up. One of you can po up. <laughs> the next step is to adjust your budget and prepare for the next 10 months of doctor's appointments, uh, co-pays, uh, crazy appetite cravings, and 
<laughs> all of a sudden weird aversions to things that you used to love and <laughs> maybe that coming back and then leaving by the weekend is over wardrobe <laughs> all the things yes. right and for everybody for everybody not just the pregnant person <laughs> listen what's the word uh i really have to go back sympathy weight sympathy weight i am i will tell you right now i am still carrying sympathy weight <laughs> It is a struggle. <laughs> so there's a lot to consider. Uh, let's break down a couple of things. I think the big one, and, and squarely from a financial perspective, if you don't already consider opening a health-specific savings account, like an HSA or an FSA. If you're that corporate worker, you've got your plan. This is one of those things where you may be saying, oh, well, I've got good insurance. I've got this company that I work for. But you really want to take a second and say, all right, well, is this coverage or is this type of plan what I need going forward? Obviously, the benefit of an HSA or an FSA is that they allow you to use pre-tax dollars to cover medical expenses versus post-tax dollars, which is a huge, huge savings. So again, as you're thinking about things like that procedure, all of the doctor's visits, Mm -hmm. all of the medication, you want to be able to save as much money as you can. And so if you can use pre-tax dollars that are taken directly out of your uh, account or out of your paycheck, excuse me, it makes uh, covering those costs a lot less expensive. Second, you want to start uh, reevaluating or, in most cases, beefing up your emergency fund. There are three of you now or maybe four of you now, Mm -hmm. depending on how many pieces of, what is it? How many loaves of bread in the oven? What? I'm just making stuff up. <laughs> you are. Isn't it like a bit you bun just, in the oven? You must be depleted from food and allergies. That, that must be it. <laughs> but yeah, you want to reevaluate that, right? Because you've got more people in your house. And so the number of emergencies or the number of emergencies and things that may happen will go up, especially when you have a child. I remember freaking out when we first gave our son, I think I made like a little jasmine rice. I had chopped up some vegetables and put some shrimp in there. But I was watching him like a hawk. Like one, like, does he like it? Is he mm-hmm. going to give me the sound that I want to hear? But like, also, is he going to have some kind of allergic reaction? Because I know my niece mm-hmm. is really allergic to shellfish, right? And so mm-hmm. again, you go through this process pretty much every single day because you know you can't always give him or her the same uh, thing. And so you're giving new foods, but you're also holding your breath, waiting to see if they like it and and dealing with those kinds of things. In that case, he did not have a reaction, but he did when we gave him eggs. And Mm -hmm. he did for sure uh, when we gave him a PB&J. And so uh, we didn't end up in the actual emergency room, but we could have. That time. Right. For some people, I have a friend who gave his kid uh, some cashew uh, mm-hmm. ice cream and man, his face swole up mm-hmm. and it restricted his breathing and et cetera. Right. So these aren't things that you plan for. Ice cream is typically a pleasurable moment, but it turned into uh, a quick emergency. Right. So these are things that you really want to prepare for. You also want to sort of as a dovetail from that is plan for the implications of taking more time off than you would have normally had. You have no idea how much more time off you're likely going to need. And obviously if you've already used your vacation time and personal time, if you even have it, Right. You might be in a situation where now you've got a loss of income because you're having to take off uh, more time, which might be unpaid. So these are things that you can't really prepare for, but there are things that you can do far in advance in case you find yourself in those kinds of situations. On the more positive sides of things, if you are also accustomed to taking breaks, you might want to go ahead and schedule that little baby moon Mm -hmm. early. Right. Go ahead and put it on the calendar, block it out, prepay, do whatever you need to do to protect that time so that you are making sure that you're walking into this birth uh, fully rejuvenated or as rejuvenated as you possibly could be, because you really don't know when you might be able to take that vacation again. So it's certainly something to think about. A couple more annual uh, sales are a great time to stock up on things like baby gear. I remember when we got our crib in Sherla. I wouldn't normally shop on <laughs> Black Friday, but again, yes. Black Friday came up and I was like, actually, like I do, I, need, I do need to go. A crib. <laughs> and I hadn't even thought about it. I was yeah. like, you know what? Let's make that list. And so it was things like the crib and uh, I forget what that little egg, the rocker, what was it called? Oh, the Mama Roo. Mama Roo, which just got recalled, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we gave ours away. But yeah, all those things, like those things are expensive. I think mm-hmm. that Mama Roo was like $300 Yeah, at the it was time. ridiculous. It was ridiculously expensive. <laughs> get to my regrets You might soon. get 15 to 20% <laughs> off or something like that. So yeah. Black Friday might be different as you're thinking about having a child. Last thing I'll say is sort of on a smaller scale, but... 
as you are thinking about your grocery shopping and food, it's such a question mark. Mm -hmm. But one of the big things that I would say you really want to be mindful of is reevaluating the role that buying in bulk may play in your household, right? So you might not think that that's you. And I think, like me, honestly, like when you think about buying in bulk, it's like, I don't need five pounds of mayonnaise. (laughs) It's like, you're right. But it's not just, no one needs five pounds of mayonnaise. Just to be clear. (laughs) Maybe church groups. But there are other things that you can buy at like a Costco or these sort of bulk stores that make this process much easier for you, right? Things like baby formula, especially right now, Mm -hmm. because it's so difficult to still get your hands on it. You start thinking about things like diapers and wipes and sanitizer. You have no idea how much Mm -hmm. more sanitizer you're going to Mm -hmm. use when you're wiping butts 15 times a day. So (laughs) things like that, you really want to reevaluate your shopping habits, the stores that you frequent, and whether or not you're going to need a membership or something like that. Uh, So all of those things, not to mention the cravings. Mm-hmm. Not to me. You, you can't get through. You might have thought <laughs> that you had enough Oreos. Listen. But you do not have enough Oreos. You never have enough you Oreos. You don't have nearly as many Period. pickles as you think you need. <laughs> you need more pickles. No, that's completely true because I know moms who could only eat one thing while pregnant. Like, I can only eat beef tacos. I eat them every day, right? <laughs> and I would literally eat an orange and a, like a sleeve of Oreos yeah. <laughs> almost every night. And And I would drink pure cranberry juice. Like that's how I kind of scratched my wine itch. Not the ocean spray. I'm talking like the pure one, which is like really tart and kind of gross. But I had to buy it from Walmart because it was literally half the price as it was at the grocery store. And And I'm not still expensive. And it was still expensive. Yeah. I'm not a Walmart shopper, but these are the exceptions you make when, you know, you got cravings and you need something every single night. Yeah, all of a sudden she was putting things on the list. I was like, I don't even know what this is. Yeah. I don't know where this I don't know where you think this is, but no, it's not at this store. You gotta go to another store. <laughs> Yeah, there are a couple of things that I would not do looking back. I would not have spent a ton of money on maternity clothes. First of all, they're expensive. And I basically rebought an entire wardrobe of maternity clothes that I ultimately gave away. So go ahead and join Buy Nothing groups or your local mom's group on Facebook to see what you can get for free. And then if you do need to buy items, focus on items that you can wear postpartum to. So things that are stretchy and soft, because like my girl Liz, Mrs. Frugal Woods, for those that are familiar, like she says, maternity clothes are like Christmas trees. When the time is right, you really want them. But once the season is over, you really want them out your house. So I would not have spent nearly as much money on maternity clothes. I also wouldn't have bought as much new as we did. So things like the Mamaru, baby swings, that little infant tub. Like if I had just been a little more patient, we could have secured way more secondhand than I did. Tub? You know, you had to put when you couldn't. Oh, the blue one. Yeah, you couldn't pay. You can't put loose babies in the bathtub. So there's like a little chair that you put them in. Why do you regret that? We needed that. I know, but I could have gotten one for free. Oh, we ultimately ended up saying. giving it away. Gotcha. Right. So. There's just things that you can get for free that have very short use lives because eventually your baby starts sitting up and you no longer need it. So you give it up anyway. You stayed in that tub for a while, though. About like eight, nine months, Couldn't something like that. It. Yeah, I think that was just us not wanting to fill up the bathtub. It's Either true. way. <laughs> you, 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 will, you will find out. If, if there's a plan and it's working, you stick to that plan. Exactly. Do not deviate. Do not deviate from the plan. And then the last thing I would not do is wait to figure out childcare. And this yeah. is, again, based on feedback from my pregnant friends now. You will need to get on wait lists as early uh, as yeah. possible now and lock in that pricing so that, again, you can start to be prepared for that expense. But even if you don't, if you're not pregnant and you're planning on having a kid that goes to daycare, you can bet on an average of $1,400 a month. It's higher depending on your cost of living. Yeah. So a couple of things are jumping out. One, just in terms of themes, one is around timing, like planning for a, a child uh, it arguably starts about a year in advance. Yeah. Right. Easily. And that's everything from how you look at your health insurance or uh, during open enrollment period oh, yeah. or in thinking about making sure that you're exploring and getting on lists for daycare if you're going to be using that. And the second theme is really around like, I don't want to call it frugality, but it's around thrift, yes. like being mindful of thrift. Like if you don't identify with that term, find one that you do, but you absolutely do not need 
all the things. I you think it's safe to it. say that every mother and father out there will say, we didn't need half this yeah, stuff. Yeah, we didn't need the white warmer. You did not need this <laughs> We stuff. didn't need the shusher. <laughs> the white warmer actually dried out the wipes and made it you did. waste wipes. It like, did. it was just a waste <laughs> You know what I mean? Like in my mom, she's old school. She was like, well, "You don't need the uh, the bottle, the warmer. bottle warmer." They, they're wrong about that. She was that. old school. She Absolutely. wanted to put yeah, the water putting... in the pot. I was like, "You just scalding hot <laughs> water, holding a baby around boiling water." Yeah, this is no. a terrible <laughs> idea. But I digress. Okay, so we talked about pre-baby. We talked about, I guess, during pregnancy. Let's talk about birth. I don't feel like I should be kicking off this part of the conversation, <laughs> but I'm going to just offer up a couple of quick points. The average cost of giving birth in the United States is $20,000, and the average insurance company will cover basically around 80% of that, so $16,000, uh, which leaves you, the parents, the mom, with $4,000 or more that's left for you to come out of pocket. Mm. Literally, uh, the only advice that I got <laughs> <laughs> like from dads was like, man, when the baby comes and they roll in that cart, it was like you would think we were at like an old school Chinese restaurant or something like that. They were like, man, take everything off the cart. That's how they were talking. About. Take yeah, they everything. Were. Take and they because they just keep bringing it. It's like yeah. uh, it's like the Brazilian steakhouse. Yeah. <laughs> it's like go into the hospital if you choose to uh, give birth in a hospital and treat that cart yeah. like a Brazilian steakhouse. Just yes. put whatever color flag and say you need more. <laughs> it is their responsibility to refill it. And it was it had everything. It did. It was like diapers, wipes, yeah, suction things. Little Similac, little mm-hmm. like sample size Similacs, uh, mm-hmm. you name it, disposable bibs. Like, take it all because you're going to need it all. You're going to use it all. And you're paying for it. And you're paying for it, right? So, so take it all. Take b- it. Bring an extra bag just to fill it up <laughs> with all the stuff that you're supposed to get because, to your point, you're paying for it. Besides that, I would also throw this out. And again, I feel grossly inappropriate saying this because I am a man who cannot bear children. But do everything you can to be healthy, right, Mm -hmm. to increase the likelihood that you are giving a natural birth because the number that we quoted was really based off of a natural birth. A vaginal birth. Vaginal birth, excuse me. Uh, C-sections are incredibly more expensive, but I think even more important than that, it just introduces a wider set of risks that obviously there are financial implications among several other implications, but recovery time, etc. So all of those things you really want to think about. Uh, there are tons of articles and books about this stuff online, uh, so don't sleep on that stuff. But again, speaking to now the non-pregnant partner, I'm mm-hmm. going to use that term, the easier the birth is for the mom, the better it is for the household, right? So yeah. show up, do your part, uh, do your own set of research, uh, tag team this thing and really kind of like be there every step of the way because it, it really just helps. Yeah, it does. Now, as far as medical expenses, they are annoying. They continue to come, but they, they are very real. Up. Yeah, they they pop up and they pop up in your child's name and your name. Oh, they and sure do. They come. They wait just till keep wait coming. till the, the mail comes. Yeah, and it's like, no, it's not even. It'd be like six you. nine months later. It's right. like oh, the anesthesiologist forgot to get his cut. Here's mm-hmm. another bill. So there's a proactive solution for medical expenses, and then there's the reactive one. This is my advice across the board for medical expenses in general. If you can, go ahead and enroll in a healthcare savings account like Julian talked about. But just keep in mind, there's two of them. There's an HSA health savings account, and then there's the federal FSA federal savings account. If you enroll in an FSA, just remember that the funds don't roll over. I'm not a big fan of FSA. I know, but you you some people don't want a high deductible healthcare plan. I get it. So, with an FSA, you don't have to have the same high deductible healthcare plan like you do with an HSA, but you got to use them funds or you lose them funds. Sure will. So, be cognizant of the timing of your contributions. Don't contribute a bunch of money in a year that you're not going to give birth or have a bunch of medical expenses. Now, the reactive approach is whether you have an HSA or not, or an FSA or not, you need to ask for an itemized list of everything you were charged for, because a lot of times there were errors. There, You weren't the only person giving birth that day. They might have messed up your room number and put somebody else's charge on yours. If your bill turns out to be correct, then the next step is really just to assess your ability to pay it. If you're not able to pay it, go the extra step and ask the hospital about assistance programs that they have and see if you're eligible for any of them. A lot of times they'll just waive it or put you on a payment plan or give you a reduced bill if you express some sort of hardship in not being able to pay the bill. That's it. 
All right, a uh, bit of advice for the non-pregnant partners. I'm going to go ahead and trademark that. <laughs> the MPPs? The MPPs out there. <laughs> uh, and that is to take classes if you can. At our hospital, the one that we, uh, our son was born in, they offered these classes. And so in my case, there was like a daddy boot camp, which was really helpful. This isn't really a financial thing, but it was really only it, it I kinda is, say, though. Like 20 bucks or something like that. For me, uh, I'd never held, I'd, I'd held a baby one time before and you had an opportunity to do it there, but I was still kind of nervous. But it's pretty cool because you have like existing fathers or like graduate dads, right? <laughs> Who show up with the baby. Uh, and it's like a trial run. It's like, all right, here's your time. Like you want to strap on this kid and mm-hmm. learn how to use a, uh, a sort of baby holder thing and, you know, <laughs> a baby get, carrier, baby carrier. See, it's been a while. I don't remember <laughs> any of this stuff. I'm like focused on the now <laughs> and tomorrow. Like I don't even remember what that stuff was called. Um, it's like the snip just wiped your memory. This away. Is. Everything went. <laughs> they took it. Everything went with it. <laughs> But there's, you know, it was a pretty cool class and it's like only a day. But I say that because in my experience, and I think a lot of men will likely uh, have a similar experience, like you're not really going to get a lot of advice. Like they're just going to like fall into the typical role. Everybody's going to be like, ooh, it's a fight club. Good luck. And hitting you with the the one liners. Like it's actually helpful to finally be in a place where it's really about asking those kinds of detailed questions and getting some practice doing things like holding a child or practicing changing diapers or getting a real life experience of like, this is what it's like at this hospital. So this is what you need to prepare for. Our grandparents even took a class. They had a grandparents class, which was super helpful because again, if you think you struggle with getting them to connect to Wi-Fi now, Mm -hmm. good luck getting them to connect to to the baby monitor monitor or learning how to turn on a sound machine or any of those things. They don't know how to do any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And last thing I will say is one of my favorite books, I think I read a couple, but my favorite book that I read uh, was The Informed Parent. It was like a really, really great book breakdown not just of what's happening uh, with the child and like you know the typical stuff like he's the size of a grape but it's like this is what you can expect from the mom this is what's happening this is why these things are important and so it just helps you to walk into this phase being as hence the title informed as possible Uh, and it was really really good okay so now that baby is home let's talk about a few ways that we kind of found our frugal right found our frugal I mean, I'm still looking for mine, but (laughs) so you know how I was thinking about this before we recorded, you know how the grown up big three is housing, transportation and food. Yes. I think if babies had a big three, it would be childcare, diapers and food. Like, I think those are the three biggest categories. I mean, healthcare, you got to put healthcare. Yeah, I mean, too. healthcare too, but I kind of lumped that into childcare. So here are my tips for finding your frugal The first one is to make a plan for diapers. So babies use the bathroom a lot, like a lot, lot. So you are going to go through over a dozen diapers a day, depending on your situation. And they're not cheap. So finding a solution for diapers can save you significant money every single month. Some people choose to cloth diaper. We were not those people and opted for disposables, but we didn't do nighttime diapers. So here's how the baby industrial complex works. Oh, I remember There this. are daytime diapers and then there are nighttime diapers that have more padding so the baby stays asleep longer. We didn't get those. We actually just ordered these insertable pads from Amazon that kind of work like a menstrual pad a little bit. But like we just inserted that and that was our hack for saving money on diapers. Other tips, word on the street is that like Walmart and Costco now offer the cheapest diapers. A lot of people think Amazon will because they have that, you know, nifty subscribe and save function. But the way to compare prices is to actually calculate the cost per diaper. So if a pack is $35, you want to divide it by the number of diapers in that pack and come up with a price per dollar. And that's what you're comparing. You're not comparing just like the overall price. The second thing is to make a plan for food. Again, some people opt for exclusively breastfeeding, which, by the way, is not free. Once you add in all of the costs of supplies, pumps, storage, nursing bras, all that jazz, it's not a free option, but it is cheaper than formula. We actually did not exclusively breastfeed. We supplemented with formula and eventually homemade baby food. But my biggest tip when it comes to food 
is actually to prepare for the unexpected. So Bo, our son, needed a special kind of formula because he was really sensitive to lactose and yeah. the yeah, it just wasn't working out. <laughs> so his special formula ended up being way more expensive than like the standard big mainstream brands. I had to order it online. It's not something I could just go and get at a store. So I had to order it in bulk. But I've also heard of moms whose babies needed like minor procedures to remove tongue ties so that they could latch properly in order to breastfeed. Yeah. So again, even if you do all of the maths and projections, you still might need some cushion. So your best bet is to just go ahead and start saving. It's all coming back. I remember them baby farts, man. Oh, yeah. It was this pungent. is when I knew uh, the Similac. <laughs> and again, so I was following this advice and I was like, all right. And again, I'm no shade to the Similac drinkers yeah, out there. Yeah, listen, the if you can babies. get, if that's you what get your it down. Kid likes, you know, yeah. congratulations. But um, our son, I couldn't do it uh, because the, the the gas that was coming out of our son <laughs> was so bad, and it lingered longer than anything that I had ever imagined. So yeah, we it was definitely worthwhile looking for some non dairy options, and I'm glad that we did. It was all kinds of stuff. Ooh, I'm getting flashbacks. Yeah, <laughs> ooh wee, what a time. Okay. Moving on to the next big expense, or at least for the first couple of years, which is childcare. We've written a couple of blog posts about this in the past. We've spoken about our decisions to do in-home care uh, for the first couple of years, and then the transition eventually to daycare, which was a really, really big one, but I'm mm-hmm. glad that we did. We were When we were traditionally employed, we opted into a daycare FSA, which allowed us to get a tax benefit on some of our child care expenses. Also, when we left corporate and shortly after our son was born, we ended up opening a 529 college savings account, which was a huge milestone. We were really passionate about being able to open that account. But those kinds of accounts basically are designed to allow you to use pre-tax dollars for your children's future education expenses. I think we've done an entire podcast about them as well in the past. So Mm -hmm. go back and find that one as well. So 529s, like an HSA, allow you to use pre-tax dollars versus post-tax dollars. That's what makes them so uh, wonderful. Uh, They are all different. You're going to have different plans for every different state, Mm -hmm. but ultimately you're basically going to be able to deduct your contributions off of your state taxes. So look that up. That's definitely something that I would put on the list of things to consider doing as you're preparing for your child. All right. I promise y'all we're not going to keep going because I know we're 30 minutes in and you're like, dang, how much more is there? But I will say that once your kid is school age, the expenses don't stop. They sure don't. Everything is more expensive because there's another person living in your home that needs things and consumes things, but doesn't contribute economically. (laughs) Just can't contribute. Can't get no job. They're truly broke little besties. So the best way to tackle this is really to burn the candle on both ends ends kind of keep the spending down but also focus on earning and specifically earning in ways that don't require your time or your energy because there's going to be a strain on both of those things but with spending our number one tip is to get over your fear of used items we just recorded a podcast on new versus used and when it comes to kids stuff opt for previously loved hand-me-downs whenever and wherever possible. We've done birthday parties where we invite parents to bring their kids old toys as gifts. You know, if you've got an older kid and they have a favorite toy that they're no longer playing with, like Bo would love to have it. We've swapped stuff with colleagues who have kids that are slightly older or slightly younger than us. We have done it all. Kids grow really fast and they get bored really easily. So the amount of stuff that you can accumulate and then wonder where your money went can be really significant. I'll also add to keep your receipts and don't buy anything until you actually need it. It's very tempting to think, like we said earlier, that you need the wipe warmer or whatever the latest gadget is. But most of the times you don't need it. And you also don't know if your baby would like it. I remember buying a baby swing and my son was just nauseous the whole time. Like couldn't even use it. He was just like, I don't know what this is. But please get me out of here. It's not relaxing at all. I'm not going to sleep in this. Yeah. And I'll also say one of the things you should prepare for is how generous other moms are. Right. They are like more than willing to actually give you the things because you're actually giving, you know, it's one on 
uh, it's one of the things that have just been on the list, right? To clean out the, the the drawer or clean out the toy chest or the books or something like that. And so when you show up, you know, still asking questions like, oh, my God, you don't got to worry about that. I'll buy it for you. Yeah. So don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to inquire. Uh, don't be afraid to give, right? Mm-hmm. Like this is sort of what community is all about. I will also share uh, this uh, before we wrap it up. Is this around food? Because obviously that's a big part of it. But we wrote an ebook. Uh, it's called Eat Better on a Budget. And the bonus chapter in that book was really all about how to introduce new foods to your kid. And there are multiple benefits for why you would want to do this. First, it trains the palate early. So it gives your child a greater appreciation for a wider variety of flavors and textures. That is so important, flavors Mm -hmm. and textures. Secondly, it helps you identify allergies early in the process. Three, uh, it makes travel so much easier. Yeah. Like if you're able to take a vacation or go somewhere with your child, especially within the first, what is it, two years mm-hmm. where you can where basically can have free. a lap baby and yeah, it's free. Child. So you want to be able to do that and actually have a pretty good time. So take full advantage of it. Introduce new foods, different flavors and textures as early as possible so that you can maximize that two year window. Because trust me, when you buy that third, <laughs> that ticket, third ticket, it changes your <laughs> appetite for travel tremendously. Especially when they end up leaning on you Man. in your seat anyway. It's like, I should, you should be able to be exactly. a lap baby. Exactly. You all in my seat. You, I should get half off. I should get half, half off. Half your body is leaning <laughs> over on my side. But I mentioned that e-guide uh, in that particular chapter because it's really the full breakdown of how we did it. Again, going back to my previous career, I used to be a professional chef. There's one thing I know is food. I used to make my son's food, introduce a bunch of flavors, and today uh, we really benefit from that. And so that's something that you guys can do as well. Uh, it is available in downloadable PDF. It's also available on Apple Books and Amazon Kindle. So check it out. It's like having a little chef in your back pocket. Oh, that sounds uncomfortable. It does sound uncomfortable. <laughs> All right. Final thoughts. So my final thought is having a kid is expensive, but there are ways to raise a child in a thoughtful, thrifty and fulfilling way without breaking the bank. At the end of the day, you just need to allocate your resources differently. The money that you save by not buying the fanciest stroller or the latest hoodad is money that you can put aside to pay for swim lessons later or help with college costs down the line, right? So just remember that guiding small babies into healthy adults is a really long game. So you just want to make sure that you're planning for the later years too and ideally putting that money to work so that when you need it, it's there with no issues. Love it. Love it. All right. My final thoughts. If you're like us, you probably question whether or not you are ready. You're not sure. You think you're ready. You took care of your niece so you know you're ready. You're not ready. (laughs) You'll never know if you're ready. Uh, But you can be financially prepared. I think I alluded to this earlier. I would say a good year is probably the best that you can start. Anything earlier than that, you're probably doing the most. A year in advance, when you start focusing on the big things like childcare and uh, healthcare. If you can start that process and then getting your body right, doing everything that you can to make sure that you're prepared emotionally and physically for that process, the financial aspect like preparing and saving uh, gets much, much easier. So start early, just like everything else, and you'll be fine. Don't call me for any more <laughs> advice. Well, thank you for listening to another episode of the Rich and Regular podcast presented by Success. If you like what you heard, feel free to drop a little something in Bo's college account. You know what I'm saying? A little dollar or two. Just kidding. If you like what you heard, please leave us a very free five-star rating and review on the Apple Podcast ratings and review page. We will see y'all next week. 